there, I'm Dr. Amber Wardell, and these are five self-care practices that everyone can do on their own and at home in order to improve their overall mental wellness. Number one is practice self-study. There's a beautiful term in Sanskrit called svadhyaya, and it is all about self-study and self-reflection, looking inward at our choices, our behaviors, and our motivations, and using that to understand ourselves better. There's a lot of focus on external things in contemporary discourse about self-care. We talk about taking bubble baths or getting facials. And although these things are really great in time, they aren't always the best things for really nourishing our minds and our souls. They kind of send us everywhere but inward. Self-care means examining our inner selves through such practices as therapy. And if therapy isn't accessible, then journaling, meditation, and self-reflection that can be done at home on your own time. Number two, learn to set appropriate boundaries. You can care for other people and have healthy boundaries. One does not negate the other. Unfortunately, it can be really scary to set boundaries, especially if we have been brought up in a home or in a culture that tells us that doing so is selfish. There's a phrase that I love that says, boundaries are how I love both you and me well. A boundary is an invitation to relationship with someone else, not a way of pushing them out. Boundaries say, here's how you and I can have proper, fulfilling, nourishing relationship together. Number three, speak your needs unapologetically. A lot of us, particularly as women, have a strong aversion to speaking our needs. I think it ties back to the same thing with boundary setting in that we feel like we're being selfish when we say what we need. One of the biggest places where I struggle with this is within my own marriage. Sometimes I find myself wanting my husband to read my mind rather than me speaking my needs to him. And no one is happy in a situation where I'm asking my husband to mind read. He's always letting me down and I'm always feeling frustrated. When I speak my needs to him, I give him the opportunity to meet those needs and he enthusiastically meets them. When we speak our needs, we give people the chance to show up for us. And when we are having our needs met because we are speaking them clearly, kindly, and unapologetically, we can be better at meeting the needs of the people in our care too. Number four, learn communication skills and conflict resolution. There's a lot of discourse, particularly online, about setting boundaries and going no contact when there's conflict with other people. And there is certainly a time and place for doing that. But that being said, we are social beings who thrive best in community with other people. When the only tools we have in our tool belt are going no contact or setting a firm boundary, we're going to risk losing important and meaningful relationships in our lives. We have to understand that those tools are necessary and important and also cultivate other tools that help us have harmony and community with others, especially when conflict arises. And actually the art of having good communication skills and conflict resolution includes all of the three things that came before it on this list. We have to engage in svadhyaya, in self-study. We need to look at how we're feeling when the conflict arises. We need to search for understanding and empathy towards the other person in the conflict. We need to examine whether we have triggers and traumas that are contributing to this problem, but that maybe have nothing to do with the current problem. Sometimes in conflict management, we have to be able to set boundaries, ones that invite someone in rather than push them out and create safety in the relationship. And we have to learn to speak our needs, to communicate how this conflict is making us feel and how we need things to be different. It also includes things like active listening, approaching the conversation with honesty and empathy, and cultivating a sense of safety and mutual positive regard even through the conflict. Number five, cultivate authentic self-compassion. You're never gonna be perfect and life is full of obstacles and mistakes. A lot of us learned early on how to give grace and compassion to other people, recognizing that they're human and fallible, but we don't give that same grace to ourselves. Something that I've been learning, especially through therapy, has been that I don't have to be perfect and I can confront my shadows and my demons and the parts of me that I don't like very much with love and compassion. I can be honest about my shortcomings and my challenges without judging myself harshly. And I find that when I'm approaching my challenges and shortcomings with love and compassion, I am able to change and grow and heal those things even better than if I'm coming at it from a place of self-reproach. We have to embrace the fact that we are multi-dimensional people, that we are not black and white, that we're very gray. We have good and bad, we have darkness and light. We have strengths and weaknesses and all of those things come together to make us the beautiful person that we are. And in my opinion, that's the only kind of self-care that's worth anything. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Amber Wardell. If you like this topic, you might want to check out my book, Beyond Self-Care Potato Chips, Choosing Nourishing Self-Care in a Quick Fix Culture. It releases October 29th, 2024, but it is currently available for pre-order everywhere books are sold.